we start in Nashville, where you and I will be on the scene along with our partner, Blake Lovell, who couldn't make it for this video today, but will join us there inside Bridgestone Arena, Vanderbilt, and Arkansas at 6 Central. And if you're going to the tournament, Nashville is on Central Time. You can catch that on the SEC Network. Max, these teams have played once on February the 27th when Vanderbilt scored an 85-82 upset of Arkansas in Bud Walton Arena. The Commodores in this one got 22 points from Ezra Magnon, 19 from Tyron Lawrence, or excuse me, 21 from Tyron Lawrence, 19 from Vin Allen Lubin, and 11 off the bench from Paul Lewis. Arkansas, 36 points from Caleb Battle, 19 from L. Ellis, 15 from Tremont Mark, but not much help elsewhere. Uh, and, and Vanderbilt pulled a shocker in that one. What are we expecting in this one? I, if I'm being honest, I'm kind of expecting something similar, another rock fight. Um, if you if you look at the, the numbers in this game, uh, Danny didn't shoot the ball well at all, at all. It really didn't. It was four of 16 from three, uh, missed nine free throws. I mean, they got kind of whatever they wanted inside. Ben Allen Lubin only missed – one shot. Lubin went nine of 10, uh, which is kind of nuts. Manion with a very efficient seven of 15 from inside. So they got whatever they wanted inside, um, but they did not shoot well whatsoever. Um, and then on the flip side, Arkansas, kind of just a mediocre, you know, 33% from three, not great, not terrible. 48% from two, same thing. Got to the line uh, 31 times. This was one of the, another one of the battle games. Um, on this stretch, shot 17 free throws, did battle. So um, that was I, – I kind of expect, you know, more of the same. Arkansas got out on the front foot here. Vanderbilt punched back. Then Arkansas just a little bit too little too late. Ken Palm has this as a six-point game. Torvik has it, I think, five and a half, six. Um, this is going to be another game uh, where I feel like – the general public here is kind of riding high on on Arkansas down the stretch here to end February, early March. They like the battle numbers. Uh, the scoring is way up for this team, uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't just draw a conclusion so quickly uh, because there's some things that Vanderbilt can do that that can make this close here, Chris. Yeah, I'm looking at some things with Vanderbilt and it's just an awful shooting team. I'll just give you some some stats uh they're they're startling yeah given Vanderbilt's history and tradition with shooting teams 349th in the country in effective field goal percentage that is valuing the three appropriately it's giving extra weight on field goal percentage it's it's 358th nationally in three-point percentage 28 percent that's bottom 10 in the country it's a 71% foul shooting team. In fact, I look at the components, and I I am just bewildered how this does not rank lower than the 204th offense in the country. But we watch these teams play, and, and what you and I know is that Vanderbilt has got two guards, and Ezra Magnon and Tyron Lawrence, who are really good. In fact, this time a year ago, those guys were carrying Vanderbilt to a run in the SEC tournament that included an upset of Kentucky. Arkansas, on the other hand, has got Caleb Battle and Tremont Mark, who really we we don't really talk about Arkansas a lot in the, the top tier of, of SEC teams this year because Arkansas is seeded 12 out of 14 teams in this event. But we've seen Caleb Battle just go on a heater. We've seen Tremont Mark, who's their best player, do some things. And, and I think this is what's troubling if you're Arkansas. The last time you played this game, Battle got 36 points. Mark got 15 Arkansas was 26-31 from the foul line. Uh, you put you put all that on paper. You say, hey, Arkansas is at home. It wins this game easily. What in the world happened? Well, here's what happened. Vanderbilt was 25-41 of 41 from two-point range. And that included Vin Allen Lubin being 9-10 uh, from, from two-point range. So I, I think that's your, your key in this game. Makai Mitchell... Those guys, can can they lock it down and keep Vanderbilt from getting easy stuff underneath because the Commodores are not a team that's probably going to line up and, and go 13-27 to 27 from three and, and beat you that way. 
But I mean, but it could. I mean, the guard plays there, but it just there's not enough shooters on the floor to where you can really, you know, they'll they'll use Mark, I would think, to lock down Tyron Lawrence and you know, they didn't take their chances with Lubin and, and Makai Mitchell inside. Well, interestingly, Chris, we've been talking a lot about Makai Mitchell lately and, and how much of a boost he's given uh, Arkansas. Listen, I'm going to read off his point totals last seven games, just real quick, and fly through them. 21, 22, 13, 0, 13, 19, 18. What's that zero sandwiched in there? Oh, that's the game against Vanderbilt. That's the game against Vanderbilt. Uh, Trevon Brazil only played 17 minutes, five fouls, fouled out. Um, so this front court for Arkansas had just a wacky game, wacky game last time. Uh, no one for the front court got going. Chandler Lawson, two points. Makai Mitchell, zero. Um, so that's also interesting um, because Vanderbilt did not have Tassos, Camateros. So it was it was 36 minutes of Lubin. Lubin won that battle by a long shot in the first time, first game. Um, so I'm sure Makai Mitchell in the, the front court of Arkansas is going to be challenged by this coaching staff to, to perform better than they did last time. Um, so I doubt we'll see another another goose egg from, from Mitchell on the scoreboard. Um, yeah. You ready for picks? I, I'm ready for picks. I'm, I'm going back. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look through this. Uh, I'm doing a lot of this from memory. I'm going to try to verify it as we're, we're doing this. Okay. Back on January the 23rd of 2021, Arkansas beat Vanderbilt 92-71. Uh, man, you, you look at <laughs> it, it, names from that game. I'm, I'm looking at the box score now. There's not a player on the roster from from either team that, that played on the rosters now that played in that game, which is um, that's welcome to college basketball in, in 2024. Yep. 2022. Vanderbilt goes to Bud Walton, beats Arkansas 75-74. Uh, there was no return trip in that one. Last year, Vanderbilt has Arkansas in Nashville at home, wins that one 97-84. That's when Vanderbilt got on a heater. I don't believe those two teams played again. Looking at this, I don't see a matchup. And then this year in Bud Walton, we just went down what happened. It's pretty astonishing if you know what these two teams have done the last couple of years. Arkansas has been to a couple of NCAA tournaments in that span. Didn't matter. Um, in fact, I guess it's been to three. Um, didn't matter. Vanderbilt won those games. There's just something that Jerry Stackhouse does in these games with, with set, scheme, something that, that I don't know if he knows – Tendencies that Arkansas's got, I don't know what it is he knows that's in the secret sauce. But they've had Arkansas's number. I picked it in the bracket when we did our bracket reveal of the SEC tournament. I'm going to stick with it, Vanderbilt, to win. Okay. Well, you you said, you know, you don't, you don't know exactly what it is. And I don't know either. But I'll tell you one thing this season, stylistically, why Vanderbilt is, is kind of made to give this Arkansas team fits. How does Arkansas score? We know how they score. It's only one way, pretty much. Free yeah. throw line. How, how has Battle gone on this t absolute tear of a scoring run? He shot double-digit free throws in every game. Um, there's one thing Vanderbilt does well defensively. One, they don't foul. They're second in the SEC in fouls committed. They only commit fouls at a rate of 28.9%. Arkansas commits fouls at a rate of 40.8. So I know that the free throw battle in the first game was pretty much dead on. That was pretty much equal. Um, where in usual Arkansas games, they're crushing the free throw battle. Um, so that's just one area. This Vanderbilt team does not foul on defense very much. Um, so that's just an area that kind of neutralizes a bit of the Arkansas offensive attack. Listen, I have Arkansas in my bracket. I'm going to... I'm going to pick Arkansas to win outright here. But when I tell you, if this is a spread of multiple possessions, six, seven out there, like you said, stack just the way that he game plans and the way that this team is built, they defend without following. I would not be surprised at all. I would actually be more surprised if this is a blowout. 
I bet this is very close game. Yeah, I think so. If it is a blowout, I would think that favors Arkansas. It's just a better yeah. team. There's, there's, look, I thought this team preseason was a top 10 team in the country. It, it didn't get close. Point is, I, I thought the assemblage of talent was enough to get them to that level. I overrated them. So did a lot of other people. But I, I still think, you know, unless I overrated them by an astounding amount, that they're still capable of, of winning a couple of games in this event. That that could very well be the Wednesday game. I'm going to go with what history tells us. So, by the way, that, that spans two NCAA tournament seasons, not three. Because 2021, Arkansas won that game, went to the tournament. But my point is, Arkansas has been to the last two NCAA tournaments. Vanderbilt's not. didn't matter. Vanderbilt won the game anyway. All right, moving on to the nightcap, which is going to be scheduled for 35 minutes after the conclusion of that one. Uh, so probably around 8.30 Central. We've got Missouri and Georgia, uh, two teams. We know Missouri's story, winless in conference play. That's hard to do. Also very unlucky in conference play. We have talked about Missouri's Ken Palm luck rating. I think that is last in the NCA. Uh, actually, if you look at Ken Palm, Missouri rated higher than Vanderbilt. And I think in conference play, I'm, I'm going to look at this too, just to be sure. Um, I think Missouri actually had a higher Ken Palm rating than did Vanderbilt in, in league play. Uh, no, it didn't. Vanderbilt by just a little bit. Uh, no, I stand corrected. Uh, Missouri um, ha had an adjusted defense, uh, adjusted efficiency margin um, overall about three points per hundred possessions, four points per hundred possessions higher than Vanderbilt uh, in the league. I think, let's see, Missouri was better offensively and they were identical defensively. So Ken Palm has Missouri, even though Vanderbilt won four games, is a better team than Vanderbilt. That tells you a little bit about how unlucky mm -hmm. Missouri was perceived to be. Missouri last time out against LSU trailed by 21 points in the second half, made a run late. This is this has been a common thing with Missouri. Uh, even without much to play for, this is a team that keeps fighting to the end. It has got Sean East, who we put, I believe, on our third team all SEC team. Despite the season that Missouri had, he was amazing, was very efficient from the field, was very good in, in terms of playing a lot of minutes. And it's hard to be efficient, hard to play on a bad team, and log a lot of minutes as the point guard where there's a lot of wear and tear on you. But he did it, so hats off to that kid. Georgia, on the other hand, um, a team that I think we were both high on yeah. mid-January. We, we felt like this team had a shot. The NCAA felt like a stretch, but maybe had a shot to make the NIT. Since January the 27th on, this team's won twice. And, and that was a win over Vanderbilt on the road and a win over Ole Miss last midweek, March the 5th. Since then, went to Auburn and got beaten by 14 points in a rematch of a game. It was a bigger blowout early. Is this the game where Georgia gets it together and plays more like the Georgia we thought we'd get? But but I think you can ask the same question of Missouri. Is this the game that something finally pops from Missouri and, and it catches a break, which it has decidedly not done since December? Well, that's the that's the question that we've been tasked to answer, Chris, and it's going to be tough because we don't have definitive news on Jabri Abdul Rahim. He's uh, he's day to day. So here's the update that I that I've got. So he was in a walking boot. Um, he is a left ankle, I believe, in a walking boot for which game was it? He was in a walking boot for Ole Miss on Tuesday, March fifth. Travels to Auburn with the team, no more walking boot, but doesn't warm up in street clothes. So he, he ditched the boot, but still didn't warm up, uh, did not dress. Now he's deemed day to day. I don't know. I don't know. I would, I would put it on like a really iffy questionable tag on him, if, if in my personal opinion. And, and that's a little bit concerning because he does, he even if he doesn't put up a ton on the stat sheet, just his ability to stretch the floor, playing that stretch forward position, does a lot for the one-on-one -on -one kind of breakdown that the guards like to do with Hill and Demery and Thomason and kind of how they, they all kind of just rotate possessions. Um, so I don't really know 
Uh, Dylan James has been stepping up, and we've liked what we've seen from Dylan James, but still, Abdul Rahim is, is, is a step up. Um, looking way back, Chris, way back at their first game, this was – this was the start of <laughs> this is what started off the season for us way back Saturday, January 6th, opening day of SEC play uh, when these two teams met. Um, and it's I'm not even going to really try to, to pull from that game because these teams have changed so much since. But that's what I will talk about is how they've changed uh, Missouri in that game. Do you remember early in the season, Dennis Gates just so upset with his free throw rate every press conference we got to get to the free throw line more we got to get to the free throw line more we're getting crushed with the free throw battle they only shot seven free throws in this game now fast forward to the end of conference season they rank fifth in the sec in free throw rate so they they cranked that way up compared to first game of the season so that'll be different that'll be a little bit different there'll be a lot more pressure on georgia to defend without following, uh, especially if they don't have Abdul Rahim. There's another little angle that that makes me interested. Also, Georgia shot 43% from three in the first game. Thomason, three of six. Abdul Rahim, three of six. Justin Hill off the bench, four of eight. Pretty sure Justin Hill's four threes were a season high. Um, it was. So you had Georgia play an outstanding game. Go up, way up, blow the lead, and then hang on for a win. And you had Missouri really not play well at all. So I think that the tide is going to be turned a little bit in, in that aspect where I bet Missouri is going to get to the free throw line much more often. And I doubt Georgia shoots the lights out close to 50% like they did before. That game ended seven-point victory for Georgia. This spread looks like it's going to be about five. What are you seeing, Chris? Well, the, the the free throw stats were interesting. I, I don't know what the odds are that a team can shoot seventy nine point one percent from the foul line and go for eight zero oh for eighteen in league play, but that is exactly what happened with yeah. with Missouri. And you're looking, Sean East is an eighty five percent free throw shooter. Nick Honor, I think, missed a free throw for the first time in in, in weeks. He is a what a an 87% shooter. I think he had a string of 35 in a row. They got snapped the other day. Um, you know, let me see what Noah Carter does just for fun. Um, yeah, Man, he's, he's a, an 80% foul shooter. Tamar Bates is what? Um, you think Kim Palm? Okay, here it is. Tamar Bates is a 93% free throw shooter. I, I, I it, it's, it's crazy when you look at some of these numbers, and, and it's not like Missouri's got a lot of other guys. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm 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 just gonna cut to the chase on picks. Mm -hmm. I I pick Missouri to win this game in my bracket. I I don't know what Georgia's got to play for at this point. Maybe maybe an NIT. Birth, I, mean, I would think you'd have to beat Missouri and then beat Florida. Maybe do some more work on top of that. Um, it still might be an uphill climb. But Missouri, Missouri's going nowhere without winning this event. But what Missouri does not want to do is end the season on this kind of note. This team's played hard. It, it, at some point, Missouri's got to catch a break. And I, I'm calling my night here. Which, for the record, I've done before, and it's not worked out. But that's not going to stop me. <laughs> oh, we all have plenty of times. Um, and one more, one more little angle, just to kind of touch on those free throws as well. Mentioned how Dylan James is the kind of that forward stepping in for Abdul Rahim. Only was able to play 18 minutes against Auburn because he racked up four quick fouls. Uh, that happens in in a, an elimination game, you know, and you're you're forced to go into some depth that you haven't had to go into all SEC season and start to see the concern for Georgia. I'm going Missouri here. Um, I, I like the, I like how the first matchup, uh, I like how much Missouri has changed since then, how aggressive they've been getting to the free throw line. They should most definitely have at least one SEC win by now. Blake references the Ken Palm article on how unlucky they are. They may go, Winless again, but 
heck, if they do win, I want to be on the right side. I'm picking Missouri. You know, and the other thing too is Missouri's a you know a better offensive team than it is a defensive team, and and Georgia's had struggles defensively, so this just may be a matchup where it works. Uh, by, by the way, Blake also picked Missouri to win this game, so what we have done uh, is known as the Southeastern 14 kiss of death when we all pick a team to win. So congratulations, Georgia. You will advance and, and take on Florida on Thursday night. Well, just real quick before we wrap up, I always like to do my Bart Torvik filter to see how the team's been playing over the past few weeks, uh, last four weeks. So this is back to February 12th. Uh, since then, Georgia ranks 91st nationally, Missouri 130th. Not too yeah. far off at all from each other. No. Um, where Missouri's offense is more efficient, their defense is, is slightly worse. Kind of a wash. Um, these teams are closer than you think. Closer than you think. All right, that's it. We will be in the arena to cover these. We'll bring you something probably Thursday morning. It's a little bit in flux. Um, the internet. In Bridgestone Arena is, um, yeah, a little a little inconsistent. We'll just leave it at that so we never know. But might have a better chance of getting to actually work in the morning before the, the masses move in and, and drain the bandwidth there. So I think that's what we're going to do. Either way, hit the subscribe button. And if you enable your notifications, you'll know when we've got videos that are up. May do some live stuff. And we hope to see some of you guys watching at the tournament. If you see us on Press Row, and are within earshot, say hello to us. We, we'd love to say hello back. For Max Barr and Blake Lovell in absentia, I'm Chris Lee. We're Southeastern 14 presented by Bridge.